Hi everyone, this lesson is on fetal growth restriction. In this lesson, we're going to talk about what this is, some of the causes of fetal growth restriction. We'll also talk about the types of fetal growth restriction, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So fetal growth restriction is also known as intrauterine growth restriction, or IUGR. It is an obstetrical condition involving significantly low birth weight, but more specifically, it's defined as a fetal weight that is less than the 10th percentile for gestational age, or if it is a full-term infant that weighs less than 2,500 grams. So although this is the definition for fetal growth restriction, what's more important to recognize here is that it is where a fetus or infant does not grow to their genetic potential because we can also see very small fetuses or infants with a very low birth weight. In fact, they may have less than the 10th percentile for gestational age or be less than 2,500 grams when they are full term. But that may be normal for some individuals because that would be considered small for gestational age. But fetal growth restriction is not the same as small for gestational age because when looking at the genetic potential, the potential for growth of the infant, they're not meeting their potential. So there's some cause that is impairing their ability to grow. And that's what's going to be very key with this condition. So there are some infants that are going to be constitutionally small for their age or in relation to other infants, but that is going to be normal for them. But in this condition, it's going to be where the fetus or infant is going to be very small for their age. They're not growing to their genetic potential because of some other cause. And we're going to talk about those causes in the next slide. So fetal growth restriction is estimated to affect 3-7% to of all pregnancies. It's also going to be more common in developing nations, and in particular, it's even more common in certain Asian countries. And approximately 40% of fetal growth restriction cases are idiopathic, meaning that the underlying cause is not known or not identified. Let's talk about those potential causes of fetal growth restriction. So the causes of fetal growth restriction are broken down into three categories of causes. One category is going to be maternal causes. The second category is going to be placental causes. And the third category is going to be fetal causes. So in the category of maternal causes, these are going to include issues with the mother. So these are going to include malnutrition, smoking, substance abuse, alcoholism, which can lead to fetal alcohol syndrome in the fetus, diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes, chronic hypertension, autoimmune conditions like lupus, hematological disorders like certain thrombophilia conditions, and a previous history of fetal growth restriction. So these are all going to be potential causes in the maternal category. In the placental category, it's all about placental insufficiency, so not enough exchange of gases and nutrients across the placenta. So there's some issue with the placenta, and the causes in this category can be gestational hypertension, chronic kidney disease, placenta previa, so this is where the placenta is too close to the internal cervical os. If there are any issues with cord insertion or any cord abnormality, so this would be the umbilical cord if there's an abnormal umbilical cord insertion or any other abnormalities with regards to the umbilical cord, there can be issues with transfer and exchange of nutrients and gases. If there's prolonged gestation and if there is preeclampsia, these can also be causes within the placental category. And in the fetal category of causes, we have multiple gestation. So this is where there are multiple fetuses. So there could be twins or triplets. Congenital disorders, these could be different trisomy disorders like trisomy 13 or trisomy 18. And then the torch infections. So the torch infections are going to be a list of important infections that can cause fetal growth restriction. And they are remembered by the mnemonic torch. So T is for toxoplasmosis, O is for other, and this is mostly going to refer to syphilis. R is for rubella, C is for cytomegalovirus or CMV, and H is for herpes simplex virus or HSV. So these are the torch infections that can cause fetal growth restriction as well. So fetal growth, again, is going to require adequate gas exchange and nutrient delivery. So if there's not enough gas exchange or it's reduced for some reason, or if there's some reduction in nutrient delivery, Either of these could be due to placental insufficiency, some of those causes we talked about before, or if the pregnant patient smokes or has some other health condition or is using substances that impair gas exchange or nutrient delivery, this can all lead to reduced fetal growth or fetal growth restriction. And because of this reduction in gas exchange and nutrient delivery, we can see what we call the brain sparing effect. So the brain sparing effect is where blood and along with the blood, gases, and nutrients, are shunted to the most important and critical areas in development. And these include the brain, but also the heart, the adrenal glands, and the placenta itself. 
So we can see this brain sparing effect because of the reduction in gas exchange and nutrient delivery. Now let's talk about the clinical features that can be seen in a fetus or an infant that has fetal growth restriction. So we actually break it down into two types. Type one is going to be known as symmetric and type two is asymmetric. So in the symmetric type or type one, this is going to most commonly occur early on in gestation, typically in the first trimester. Type one accounts for 25 to 30% of cases, and it's more likely to occur from some global insult to the developing fetus. So these can include torch infections. So again, those congenital infections that occur early on in development can lead to type one or symmetric fetal growth restriction. We can also see it with certain congenital disorders. So trisomy 18 is one of those. And we can also see it with certain maternal factors like malnutrition. So something that was occurring early on in development or some large or global insult to the developing fetus can lead to type 1 or symmetric fetal growth restriction. And it's named symmetric fetal growth restriction because the reduction of body size is symmetrical. So this means that both the head and the abdomen, which would be measured by head circumference or HC and abdominal circumference or AC, are both less than the 10th percentile for gestational age. So it is symmetric. Both the head and the abdomen are affected. So because the head is affected, the brain is also affected. But when we actually look at the ratio between the head and the abdomen, it's approximately equal. Now in type 2 or asymmetric fetal growth restriction, it's most likely or believed to occur later on in gestation. And this is going to usually be in the late second to third trimester of gestation. Type 2 is going to be the most common type. It accounts for 70 to 75% of cases, and it's more likely to occur from some placental insufficiency cause like preeclampsia. So because it's asymmetric, not all bodily parts are going to be equally affected. So in the asymmetric type, it's going to be the abdomen that is affected. So abdominal circumference is going to be less than 10th percentile for gestational age. And because the head is spared, the brain is also spared, and we see an increased head to abdomen ratio. So this is going to be important with regards to type 2. Now there can be other findings in the fetus or infant depending on the underlying cause of the fetal growth restriction. So some examples that I'm just going to briefly talk about here include the following. Fetal alcohol syndrome is going to be one of them as we mentioned before. Alcoholism can be a maternal cause of fetal growth restriction. If the fetal growth restriction is caused by fetal alcohol syndrome, the infant is going to have particular characteristics. Some of these include a smooth philtrum. So the philtrum is the lip ridge and it's going to be completely smooth. This is going to be absent. A short nose. They can also have small eye openings and a thin upper lip, among other findings as well. In congenital CMV or cytomegalovirus infections, there can be characteristic findings with regards to this type of infection, including blueberry muffin spots, sensory neural hearing loss, chorioretinitis and hepatomegaly or an enlarged liver. In congenital toxoplasmosis, infants can have chorioretinitis, hydrocephalus, and intracranial calcifications. And in a potential congenital disorder, one being trisomy 18 or also known as Edwards syndrome, this is where patients can have a cleft palate, low set ears, clenched fists with overlapping fingers. So you can see in this image here, clenched fist with overlapping fingers can be a hallmark finding in Edwards syndrome or trisomy 18. And there can be other features as well. So again, these are some potential fetal or infant findings, but it all depends on the underlying cause. Now, regardless of what may be the cause of fetal growth restriction, if there is fetal growth restriction, there are complications and risks that can occur. And these can occur early on and even throughout life. So one of them is going to be fetal mortality. There is increased risk of fetal mortality in fetal growth restriction. There can also be labor and delivery issues. There's a higher likelihood that there's going to be requirement for a C-section and a higher likelihood of prematurity. Meconium aspiration is also going to be another risk for fetuses that are growth restricted. Some other complications from fetal growth restriction include electrolyte imbalances. So we can see different electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia. We can also see hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia is a low glucose level in the blood. This is due to low glycogen stores within the liver. So because of fetal growth restriction, the abdomen is going to be smaller than usual. It's not going to develop as it should. The liver is not going to develop like it should, and it's not going to store or have stores of glycogen like it should. So this is going to lead to issues with 
neonatal hypoglycemia. We can also see polycythemia and thrombocytopenia. We can also see an increased risk for necrotizing enterocolitis, and there can also be increased risk for renal failure in these newborns. As the patient gets older, there can be developmental delay, there can be issues with cognition, and even later in life, these individuals are at a higher risk for certain conditions, and some of these include metabolic syndrome, so they're more likely to have obesity and type 2 diabetes, they're more likely to have ischemic heart disease, and they're more likely to have psychological impairments such as mental health disorders and prolonged and long-lasting cognitive issues. So although a young infant may be born with fetal growth restriction, they can have long-lasting impacts of that fetal growth restriction even later on in life. So these are important to make note of with FGR or fetal growth restriction. So how is fetal growth restriction diagnosed by clinicians? So clinicians are going to use ultrasonography to diagnose fetal growth restriction. Most often there's going to be serial measurements for at-risk patients, usually every three to four weeks. So what's going to be used for diagnosis is an estimated fetal weight or an abdominal circumference of less than the 10th percentile for gestational age. And this can be further broken down into moderate and severe FGR. So moderate fetal growth restriction is going to be where the estimated fetal weight is anywhere from the 3rd to the 9th percentile. And in severe cases of FGR or fetal growth restriction, the estimated fetal weight is going to be less than the 3rd percentile. But as mentioned earlier on in this lesson, it's important to rule out genetic causes. So perhaps the parents are shorter than average. So even though the fetus is at a very low weight, they may even be less than the 10th percentile for gestational age. But because their parents are smaller or shorter, they're actually growing at their potential. So they may be simply small for gestational age and not considered fetal growth restricted. And another way to actually define or determine this is by seeing whether or not over the course of serial measurements, are they maintaining growth along a standard curve? If they are, this is a better indication as well. And if there are no other findings, such as oligohydramnios, which would be a low amniotic fluid volume, this is also another finding that can help rule out fetal growth restriction. So again, it's important to determine, is this fetus growth restricted or are they simply growing at their growth potential? Is this fetus simply constitutionally small? So their parents may be smaller. Now, although we mentioned that ultrasonography is a way to diagnose fetal growth restriction, many times it may be prompted by a decreased symphysis fundal height measurement. So in a family physician clinic, there are going to be serial measurements of symphysis fundal height throughout pregnancy. If it's found that the symphysis fundal height is three centimeters or more lower than it should be, this is going to be a trigger for a potential thought of does this fetus have fetal growth restriction and that can often lead to ultrasonography for that purpose. And then some other body measurements that can be performed in ultrasonography include head circumference, abdominal circumference, and femur length as well. Another part of diagnosing can be amniotic fluid volume estimates. So if the amniotic fluid index or AFI is less than five, it's more likely that this fetus is growth restricted. And if the maximum vertical pocket or MVP, which is going to be the largest pocket of amniotic fluid that is measured, if it is low, if that pocket of amniotic fluid is lower than it should be, there's a higher risk that the fetus is growth restricted and vice versa. So it's inversely related. So if it's a larger maximum vertical pocket, it's less likely that the infant is growth restricted. And then there are some other methods that can be used for diagnosis and management, which we'll talk about later on here. And these include uterine artery Doppler and umbilical artery Doppler methodologies. So again, ultrasonography is going to be very important, serial measurements, especially for infants at risk, amniotic fluid volume estimates, and then these other methods, uterine artery Doppler and umbilical artery Doppler. So when a clinician has diagnosed fetal growth restriction, how is it treated? So before we get into the treatment, it's important to try to prevent fetal growth restriction from occurring in the first place. So cessation of illicit substances, cessation of alcohol use and smoking, nutritional improvement and reduction of risk of torch infections are all going to be important in reducing the risk of fetal growth restriction. In the case that there is fetal growth restriction already diagnosed, umbilical artery Doppler and a biophysical profile is going to be important as these help monitor the fetus. 
So these are often done weekly. So you can see these biophysical profiles being done weekly with an umbilical artery Doppler. And in doing so, the end diastolic flow or EDF is monitored. So these measurements are going to help determine the next steps in treatment. So if there is reverse end diastolic flow, this is often going to be a trigger for delivery of the neonate. If there's absent end diastolic flow, but there is oligo hydramnios, then that's often also going to be a trigger for delivery. And if there's absent end diastolic flow, but the gestational age is less than 33 weeks, it's often going to require daily full biophysical profiles. And if the biophysical profile is low, that may also trigger the necessity for delivery as well. So these are some of the outcomes with some of these measurements. But if you want more information, please look up other more detailed protocols on the treatment of fetal growth restriction. So although there is no real treatment for fetal growth restriction, the goal of treatment is to maximize gestational age. So this is going to help reduce certain complications. But if there is a case of premature delivery, then if it is prior to 34 weeks of gestational age, antenatal steroids will be given. This will help with lung maturation. And if it's prior to 32 weeks of gestational age, neuroprotection is going to be required with administration of magnesium sulfate. So although the goal is to maximize gestational age, there are going to be cases where there is premature delivery. And because certain bodily systems are not fully developed, there may be some requirement for certain management or certain treatments like antenatal steroids or magnesium sulfate. And then a C-section may be required in some cases if there is fetal distress. If you want to learn more about other obstetrical and gynecological conditions, please check out my playlist on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.